Uh, you're listening to the oh frick, what's that? What are we called? <laughs> Heart of the Wolf Heart of, podcast. You're listening bro. to Heart of the Wolf podcast. See, I'm totally leaving all of this shit in there for our first podcast. Our, it's hilarious. Our, okay. Our first, the first book we're reviewing is Stormglass by Jeff Wheeler. It's book one of the Harbinger series. Um, is there anything else you want to say about it? Yeah. No, but I do have an interesting fact that I found while I was trying to find a summary. What is the fact? Um, Stormglass is a real thing. Like, an actual... Um, spoilers. Uh, right in the book, Seti is, like, yeah, it's like looking a, at that, like, the liquid that qu- rises and falls. Yeah, the Quicksilver. Yeah, so, real Stormglass is not Quicksilver. Um, and real Stormglass also doesn't actually work. Oh. But... Oh. Um, it was a thing. Um, it's a. I have it open here because I thought it was really interesting. Um, the liquid in the glass is a mixture of distilled water, ethanol, potassium nitrate, ammonium chloride, and camphor, which smells awful. Um, but yeah, and then the guy who made it was called Admiral Robert Fitzroy. Which oh, again, my I God. Was interesting. Oh, yeah, because that's so the guy's he, name, right? Yeah, yeah it's the uh, guy who adopts Seti. Um, and he's also like an admiral or general or whatever in the book. So oh, I, thought, but, I was like... Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, that's a cool fact that you found out. That's actually really cool. So, yeah, all did, I was trying to find was a summary, but real thing... Do you want to do a quick summary of the book? Full spoiler sum- summary? Uh, oh, yeah. So, full books, yeah. Um, did you want to do, like, do you want to split it up, like, Seti's summary and then Sarah's summary? Or is it? are you just going to kind of yeah, go? Yeah, because cause since it does hop back and forth, yeah. um, we'll go with what happens. Because Sarah's not really important to this story other than like it's clearly kind of setting up yeah for the next book be, yeah that they're going to be friends or something in the next book yeah but otherwise she's kind of just there doing her own thing but it's not really relevant they are really kind of very separate so yeah we should start with seti since the book starts with seti and i'm assuming that's how you say her name yeah um, seti of the fells yeah, so she Or the girl who can see the ghosts. Yeah, so it starts, let's see, Seti starts in the fells, and then um, Joseph or Jose's, well, see, Jose's not, doesn't work since it's got the extra S at the end. Yeah, I've, this, I've been saying Joseph in my head. Uh, yeah, so it starts with her looking for that yeah, kit, for... the... the uh, yeah, and he's out stealing food for all the orphans that live at this psycho girl's house. Yeah. And she can't find him, and she decides to go back home, and then, I remember, lo and behold... The Popo's the... there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the book's version of the police are there, and uh, surprise, surprise, are like, you know, you're, you all these kids are being neglected, and then Fitzroy scares away the, the one-eyed ghost and then said he like begs him to adopt her. And how needy. When I first when I first read it, right, I was like he accepted it so quickly. Like he was like, Okay, yeah, I'll try. And I and of course later you kind of find out why, but like it still was kind of it felt so abrupt. I was like, you, this random girl in this random house just asks you to adopt her and you go, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so well, he, it definitely, yeah. like, the beginning was, like, I think I read chapter one, like, three or four times before I could finish the book. Um, it just, uh, it was a kind of a slow chapter and. uh didn't really grab my attention very well, uh, mostly because I think it was the view of like a girl that was so young. Um, so it's written from a perspective that's just kind of hard 
to stick with, you know? Um, Because she's like, what, 12 or something? Uh, 10? Yeah, and that's not even sure because she says, I think I'm 12. Yeah. But no, yeah, so then he immediately takes her with him to his um, floating mansion manor. (laughs) Oh, right. Um, Yeah. I mean, I forget what they call them exactly, but it's floating manor, basically. And they have his, like, floating mines and... And, uh... Are uh, the mines floating? I thought the mines were on the main well, world. They might not be. I think they're just the water. Oh, it's it's weird because how the water is all like the spring somehow the spring water goes from the ground up into the manor, like and that's how there's like waterfalls and stuff. Yeah, and, I I don't get it. Like it's. It reminds me of uh, the movie Avatar. Uh, yeah, except... Well, I guess that's based off the books, but, like... <laughs> except the... it's even... It's, see, I mean, it kind of is like that with the floating rocks, it, and except there's yeah. houses on them. But it, at the same time, it doesn't, because they're still connected to the ground somehow, and that's what, that's what it doesn't ever... <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving that in there, dude. Sorry, I'm drinking a <laughs> Cider Boys Peach Country Apple Peach Hard Cider today. And it's super carbonated and making me really burpy. Um, but the point is, I can't figure out how the spring water... Go- like, it doesn't ever explain how the spring water gets from the ground up into the manor through whatever the... What's it called? The... The, whatever their the version mis- of magic. The mysteries, yeah, that's the what it mi- was. The mysteries, yeah. And, and it, I just, I guess I would just, the whole first book doesn't really explain that very well. Um, like, I don't really get the magic system other than, and it, and it seems to include science. So, like, the, like, science and magic are pretty mingled. And... But it makes it really difficult to understand what's going on, especially since the perspective is from someone that's so, so young that it really doesn't explain really. No, yeah. Well, I think the idea is that to make us feel the same frustration that Seti feels when people are always like, oh, it's the mysteries of the wind or the mysteries of the law or whatever when she asks a question about how something works and they just oh it's the mysteries and it's super frustrating for her so i think it's kind of the same thing that the author was trying to get the readers to also just be annoyed with the lack of information on the mysteries i assume in later books hopefully it will be explained at some point because i'm assuming that we're gonna follow Seti as she gets older, and Sarah. Yeah, I'm excited because in the end, I think the next book will kind of pick up speed probably, just from how it ended with them attending the school uh, to learn the mysteries. Yeah, they were both arriving at the school. Um, But yeah, as far as Seti goes, her general story is uh, what is it? Uh, Rag Search's story. She gets adopted by a rich dude. Who thinks that he she's the daughter of that woman he used to love or whatever. And Oh yeah. And then Sarah's story is the exact opposite. Where she's well, she's like the rich, you know, sheltered child that wants you know, always wants to see what it's like living a normal life. And yeah, so it's kind I of, think that was kind of the idea. Yeah, it's kind of almost Opposites. like an Aladdin-esque story where Jasmine, when Jasmine goes out into the streets, that's that's what Sarah wants to be. She wants to just like oh. dress in disguise and go out into the streets. No, yeah, that's a good example. Uh, but yeah, so they're, they're definitely opposites. You have, it's, uh, Aladdin's a perfect example. But yeah, and it almost honestly, is that story, except platonic yeah. friends instead of potential lovers. 
Well, we think platonic friends. Who knows? Oh, uh, well, I mean, they're they're t- kind of too young. To, young, well, and it really young, seems that Seti is kind of into. Oh, that's true. Oh, uh, what is that guy? People exist. Uh, yeah, but they're typ- William. Yeah, William. William. But I feel like they're typically not uh, in books. Uh, that's true. You know, you get the oh. you get the extremes. You have a lot of. Well, you had, like, sh- all straight people for the longest time, and now I feel like we're getting books with the other end, but I feel like the middle, which would be, like, bisexuals, would is still going to just be left in the dirt, kind of, in as far as book storytelling goes. Well, yeah. Uh... I can't think of any that have... I can think of plenty that have either one or the other, but not... I can't think of any that have, like, the bisexual people in it. I know. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm with you. I'm just trying to think of any. Uh, I don't know. Like, I feel like kind of like the Wheel of Time where it's implied. I feel like there's a lot of books that that it's never kind of outright stated. Like, nobody's coming out and being like, I'm bisexual. Well, yeah. Well, in the time period, you know, I think I've said this before to you um not on the show but uh he could not get published if he straight out came up and said that there was you know relation (laughs) non-cis relationships Uh, and he actually did get almost not get published for the fact that the aiel don't have or they have like multiple husbands and multiple wives like that culture Oh, so yeah, see that. Yeah, so it's but, like it's I mean, just Wheel of time was. It's a publisher issue. What, the eighties. Uh, I think there was. Uh, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. But was, let me see. Uh, this book, the Storm Glass, that was published in two thousand eighteen. So uh, he doesn't have much excuse to not or. Like, yeah, but I still feel like I they're think. not, uh, I feel like maybe it's publishers aren't ready for like the bisexual relationships in books, I feel. Maybe. I, I feel like it's a publisher oh, issue, yeah, although there is a lot of self-published authors now, and maybe this guy was one of them, I'm not sure. Um, well, I don't think so. I'll have to, I'll have to Google it later and see, because I'm sure there are, like, there are, but are bisexuals in books, but I'm also sure that it's... They're probably pretty obscure. Um, But yeah. Uh, Anyway, tangent aside. Oh, right. Um, Back to the book. Um, Yeah. uh, What was I saying? Okay, so Seti gets adopted by General Fitzgerald. Or Captain Fitzgerald? Whatever. Military guy, uh, I Fitzgerald. I remember, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then... He works for the Ministries of the Wind, or the Mysteries of the Wind, or whatever. Does... He, no, he did war. He's just now getting into wind, I think. Yeah, right? he was war, and now he's a Minister of the Wind, or whatever. And he introduces her pretty immediately to the the woman who, like runs the house magic i forget what her name was um gosh what is it she was mrs pullman it's mrs pullman yeah yeah, yeah. and she's like i guess mrs pullman is like the villain of the story yeah she kind of has the god complex where she feels like you know because seti wasn't born into it she doesn't deserve it and she just deserves to go back to the fells, which is like the poor neighborhood. Um, well, yeah, and then later in the book, it's like we find out that Mrs. Pullman was responsible for um, Fitzroy's, Fitzroy's first love, yeah, and Seti being in the fells in the first place, and wasn't she also making his current wife ill? Yep, she was making, yeah. yeah. And, and then tormenting the young, the younger daughter. Yeah, she um, can... S- Anna and... No. 
something I, I can't remember now. I don't know. The youngest daughter. Oh, it is Anna. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she can somehow control ghosts. It doesn't really go into how, other than I think the ghost lives in that room in the manor that's lo- always locked or something. But yeah, I mean, she also eventually brought Seti's one-eyed ghost, and that ghost isn't explained at all. Like, why is he? Why is that one-eyed ghost following Seti from home to home to home? Not to mention the the beast at the at the silver mines. Oh, oh it yeah, seems the beast at the unusually mines. attracted to Seti. So I hope it gets into it in later books, but as far as now, it's like kind of a mystery. Like why, why are the ghosts targeting Seti, and why is that monster in the mines targeting Seti? And why? I mean, clearly, Mrs. Pullman. I can't tell if if she knows that Seti's something different, or if. And that's why she's targeting Seti, or if it is just as simple as she doesn't feel like she belongs. Uh, Yeah, I really don't know, because she served Fitzroy's father or whatever, and, like, her and her parents were also servant, like, owner or, like, they ran the house or whatever. And I'm, it's almost like she just feels that like her position in life is to make sure that the Fitzroy family becomes as powerful as possible and she thinks not wrongly either that Seti will prevent Fitzroy from advancing is like of course uh the prince regent Sarah's father right he wanted Fitzroy to send Seti back to the Fells and not adopt her. And when he ref- when Fitzroy refused, he didn't get the position. So Miss Pullman is not exactly wrong that Seti is holding him back. But he also, Fitzroy doesn't really care. But Mrs. Pullman c- cares. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, I will say I do enjoy the society. Uh, it's I, It's set up Almost like kind of like in- interesting how like the kids can be sold for the parents' debts, and then and then they can just keep getting sold. So you're like forever under debt. And when you're so when you're a kid, you inherit all the debts of your like forefathers. Like it's it makes for a story that's like set up for conflict. And somehow the Ministry of Law got in charge of everything and has set up this system so that people are forever owing the Ministry of Law their money, you know? Yeah, I'm thinking that the Ministry of Law and Sarah's father are going to be the villains, like the overarching villains. Oh, definitely. Throughout the series. Um, but yeah, and then let's see. So Seti meets Mrs. Pullman, and Miss Pullman is sort of the villain, I guess, of the book. And eventually, six all like six all the ghosts, not only on Seti but on Anna, who unfortunately can't see them, so she's just having nightmares and shit, and has no idea why. And then I want to know how like Mrs. Pullman got these other people to like pack Seti up and ship her down to the fells like yeah it really baffles me that fitzroy's second in command would go behind fitzroy's back like that and take Seti and hostage and try and you know lock her up yeah back in the yeah, fells that was, that was weird to me and then um we also meet the person who was uh, Seti's father, but not her father, because we still don't really know. Yeah, it seems some more like woman a setup. Left Seti, yeah, because right, some woman left Seti on this random fells dude's doorstep with and, the deed or whatever. And it was clear that he slept around a lot, and it was clear that the lady also slept around a lot. So. Yeah, and then so that whole thing, like. 
I'm curious as to, I guess, what's going to happen there, because technically they still don't have any, like, proof that Seti, like, was the daughter of that woman that Fitzroy first loved. And it te- so technically the law is that that random dude is her, like, rightful father. Um, and they don't really, like, I know he doesn't want her, but yeah, he, he could can't technically aff- claim her. He can't afford her by any means. Well, even if he wanted her, he can't afford her deed, which Fitzroy already owns, which is basically their like the equivalent of like a like a license to work. Um, yeah, the deeds are kind of weird. So you can, yeah, you can buy up deeds, which. Fitzroy has quite a few deeds from Fell's folk. It, well, it's implied. And then... So to adopt, though, that's a whole separate, like, thing. Uh, yeah, but technically, I know that, like... I think that was Mrs. Pullman's plan, was to basically, I think, bribe that guy to claim her as his daughter and uh, through whatever the law is, because they don't ever explain it basically void the deed or whatever um, and make Seti live with that guy, maybe. I'm not entirely sure what the entire plan was. Well, Seti would never have been able to live with that guy. It's basically because of the way the law set up, um, that guy doesn't have the deed to his own daughter, so he can't make her live with him. Well, that's why I say, like, like, what was the plan here? Like, the, uh, Mrs. Pullman bribes that guy to send her down to the fells, and then... I think the point was that that guy could, because Fitzroy expressed interest in adopting, not just owning the deed, then the adoption fees are whatever that guy says they are. And that guy was in, I can't even, like, six figures of debt. So, basically... That guy could clear his debt away by saying to Fitzroy, "Like this is what I like. This is what my would require for you to adopt my daughter." So yeah, that's... but Mrs. Pol- Pullman doesn't want Fitzroy to have to pay something like that, like because her whole thing is to elevate the Fitzroy family. Yeah, but I think that she was thinking he would see the dollar sign and immediately back out because that's more, that's a significant amount of money, so much so that, like, it would really hurt his his house and family to the point where they might need to start taking out loans, which is something that he has been really good about not doing, you know? Yeah, I don't know. The, the whole plan seemed... Flawed, I guess. And it might not have even been Mrs. Pullman that set that part up. That could have been uh, the the Prince Regent guy. Yeah, Sarah's father. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so that is none of that stuff is really explained super great. But yeah, so Mrs. Pullman sent her down. Uh, did Joseph die? He got stabbed, didn't he? No, remember at the end, Fitzroy buys his deed. Uh, yeah, Joseph gets oh, yeah. stabbed, and then they're hiding out in that abandoned house that Seti becomes the steward for, I guess, and it reawakens the, the ghost of the manor and is in charge of all the defenses and stuff of that random broken down house, and she actually plays the music, and then and Fitzroy comes in at the last minute, of course. And yeah. <laughs> see, that's I think that's one of the biggest flaws of this book is that Fitzroy gets summoned to the the Regent's Manor for something I don't remember what. And instead of going, he pretends to go. Somehow he assumes that Seti's going to be kidnapped in that time pretends to go and then follows them, the people who take Seti, and then swoops in last minute and saves Seti from his second-in-command and Mrs. Pullman. It just seems... uh, I guess I just don't like the... (sighs) It's almost like... like, how did he know? Yeah, how did he know? (laughs) 
I feel like it's just not explained well enough. Like, I wish that in, like, the epilogue, I wish there was, like, an epilogue that it kind of explained it from Fitzroy's point of view, I guess. Because it's... Well... I mean, I get that the author's trying to keep us in the dark and kind of frustrated with Seti's situation, just like Seti is frustrated with her situation and people thinking she's too young to know these things. But uh, at the same time, it just makes it seem like almost like the divine providence cliche, where like it's like the god's hand reached in to intervene with the situation, you know, which is like... I mean, it's not unheard of or not uncommon in books, but it's kind of like the old, one of the oldest tricks in the book when you write yourself into a corner, you know? Like, what are you going to yeah. do? You're in a corner. Well, I'm going to just have divine intervention. And that's what it kind of feels like with Fitzroy just kind of swooping back in at the last minute to save Seti and Joseph. I mean, we talked about this before, not on the podcast, but about how this book was kind of just blah for us. Like, it's got really good reviews on Goodreads. It's like 4.2 or something around there. And I don't like think it's... People seem to enjoy it. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be... I mean, I wouldn't say it's a bad book. Uh, I would just say it's an okay book. The character development... I feel like Seti... Seti's character development's kind of nice. I... I don't really like Sarah. She just seems like i mean i guess her character's written well in the fact that she's pampered a pampered princess yeah not well not only she pampered but she's very um sheltered like yeah sheltered naive like idealistic like she's not wrong that her father is like a douche <laughs> but and she in a way i guess like the wheel or Jeff Wheeler trying to kind of imply that she would be a good ruler because she's thinking about like, well, why is the kid like responsible for the parents' debts? Like they didn't do shit. That's dumb. No, it's good points and um I just I don't know, this both of both Sarah and Sede just don't exactly feel real and same with Fitzroy and Mrs. Pullman uh they all kind of f feel like caricatures yeah they're like caricatures they I, I want I just felt like it was lacking in something with the characters um and you know I don't know how many books Jeff Wheeler has written uh this he has a lot if this is his first book that ever then yeah, I haven't really looked into it. Uh, this was just like one of the on only book series from him that I could find online for my. No, he's got um, he's got quite a few. I remember kind of when I was looking for a su summary. He's got uh, the Harbinger series, which is what we're reading. And he's got the King Fountain series, the Legends of Muirwood. I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it, which is another series. And I think those are his three. And I believe Muir, Muirwood is the first series that he wrote. And then I think King Fountain and Harbinger. But yeah, and he's, I'm looking at his uh, Goodreads. Um, and according to this, like, he released King Fountain one, two, and three in 2016, according to Goodreads. So that's three books in a year, and maybe that's one of the problems too. Is like he's writing maybe too fast. Um, I mean, maybe it's not that he's writing. Uh, maybe he couldn't get published, so he self-published the books that he had out. You know. Oh, maybe. But yeah. So and then same with his next ones. He so King Fountain one, two, and three all into the 2016. Four, five, six, and two thousand seventeen. Muirwood one, two, and three, all in two thousand eleven. Like he's does like three books. Sounds a year, like he I'm... writes in trilogies and then just splits it up, maybe in the editing process. Um, but kind of like I'm wondering if maybe it's uh, kind of like how I felt about Terry Goodkind's latest books, 
that he got on a timetable with his publishers and the publishers are basically going, yeah, we need this many books from you. Um, I don't know. I guess we'll see when we read the next ones if it kind of feels rushed or something. Um, but no, yeah. And then we haven't really talked about Sarah at all either in this, other than that she's a pampered princess. Well, I mean, I feel like her story is just kind of boring. Her, it's kind of, it's just slow to take off. It's a lot of her just daydreaming and idealizing until she, yeah, she until that accident in the, the, what is it, the maze thing where she finds her dad talking to the guys and then that's when it kind of picks up as yeah she doesn't her yeah her story is pretty pretty blah like well honestly this whole book right not a lot i always felt like something was gonna happen and and then then nothing (laughs) happened and it was nothing it was like this constant like just precipice of uh like climax i guess like the rising it was just like always just stuck in rising action i guess like it yeah i never got to uh like a peak and it didn't it, like it never had most books have like multiple rising rises and like, falls yeah it'll, you'll have yeah like many ones the right ri- yeah the the fluctuation of like increased tension and then an event that brings it down. And I feel like his is just increase in tension throughout the entire book until the very end and then divine intervention. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's exactly how I feel about it. Is like, I was always waiting for something to happen. Like I was always like, I was like, Oh, something's going to happen. And then nothing would happen. And then, Oh, something's going to happen. And then nothing would happen. And that's how I felt the whole book. And then, the at the end right that last god like maybe last chapter or two not even like a few pages really was her running around in like the climax of uh mrs pullman sitting sending seti down to the fells and and like i was like oh so like we got like 80 chapters of rising action and then a single like a single chapter or two of the actual event and that felt i don't know like i felt like there was like other things needed to happen and like i don't know if maybe he thought like the monster in the mines was like a some sort of thing but like it didn't feel like anything really happened there i mean it all (laughs) it could have been like it it was set up to be and then what do they do fitzroy just swoops her away and then fitzroy goes and deals with it completely off screen you know so you don't see any so that's what makes it not a climax is that like it's set up to be like a mini climax but then seti just gets swooped away and it's get taken care of off screen and that's how the chapter the chapter ends with her being like scooped away and then the next chapter begins after the whole incident with the monster in the mind so you really have no idea like what it looked like you don't know like what happened other than Fitzroy was using their gun things what are, I can't remember what they're called and, um. Bl- blunder blunder buses blunder blunder bus <laughs> so like blunder yeah bu- I don't blunder know. by <laughs> i don't know what the what the, yeah but yeah so, it, so that's all dealt with off screen which really takes away from the the climax piece of it um which just makes it it turns it from a possible climax mini climax to just more rising tension rise to action Uh, yeah no i'm in total agreement and that's that was really the whole book Uh, and when i read it on goodreads i'm gonna give it like a three because it wasn't bad but like yeah i mean it was was better than what was the i'm trying to remember the the book that i just couldn't finish uh and it's you know 
It's oh yeah, you were telling me about it. But yeah, it's very uh, like hack or sword art online where he like goes into a game. Yeah, online. yeah, that game, and I can't remember who that was by either. But yeah, like that guy had just very fake feeling characters, and then so the characters in this book at least feel a little they feel a lot better than that book well but i feel like that book's the extreme end which is probably the only reason i could finish this book though is because i had my last book like because i didn't finish the book before it uh because it was so bad and i i'm actually impressed how much we've remembered of this one because i was thinking about early i was like i could not remember anything yeah it's been like two months since we read it so i am actually quite impressed that we how much we remembered it I mean, it, once you started talking about it, then it uh, kind of came back to me, though, pretty quickly. So, um, Yeah, thank God for good memories. <laughs> yeah, I am excited. I will say I am kind of looking forward to the second book because I do feel like uh, I feel like it'll be better than this one. I, I kind of feel like this is a, like just a big prologue for like the main event, which I'm assuming will happen. Yeah either next book uh, i'm hoping that i'm i'm really hoping that the second book to this series isn't like this one well, uh, that's the, how i felt <laughs> about the wheel of, the first wheel of time book what do i always say about it is a really it, effing long introductory paragraph well yeah you've got to get through the trilogy the first trilogy of wheel of time before it picks up into its own and that's just because the you know the that's just the publishers you know they wanted the the token reboot so that's what he did as a token reboot and then he continued it after that after he was known and after he was making money off of the books and then you know at that point he was a little bit above the pub what the publishers could want you know he could kind of write his own story at that point it's kind of like the same idea this book just seemed like a introductory thing which as part of a series isn't really a bad thing, but also I do feel like there are better written series that have that hook in the first one. Like it's yeah. not a long introductory paragraph, but like, it seems like it's not uncommon for writers to kind of do a somewhat boring first book. Yeah. And, and that is true of a lot of trilogies. It's because it is kind of a setup for the entire trilogy. So it kind of does have to be an intro, but at the same time, I don't know. I've read some books that do it a lot better, in which case there's like a, like each book needs to have its own beginning, middle, and end. And then the trilogy needs a beginning, middle, and end. But each, but it all needs to kind of flow together. And it's, it's a tricky thing to do for trilogies. Well, just for books in general, uh, which is why a lot of people should start with standalone books so you get in the habit of doing, like, boom, beginning, middle, end. That's it. Because then, cause then when they expand to a trilogy, they'll still have that, they'll be used to writing in that beginning, middle, end for each book instead of, I feel like, I feel like Jeff Wheeler probably did write the, I don't know how many books are in the series, but... It, the f- I know there's at least three, and I feel like he wrote writes he just writes in three book chunks is what it sounds like, and then pop splits them up and publishes them, and that's what makes it feel like it's an incomplete book. It's I that's that's what it feels like. So there's f- currently five. I don't know if the last one published last year, so I don't know if. Well, if he, it seems like he does three a year. So he did Stormglass, Mirrorgate, Iron Garland in 2018, Prism Cloud, Broken Veil in 2019. So I don't know if that's the end or if he's going to release a th- another one and maybe it's a six book. But self, I mean, five is still a, a good chunk. Um, but I'm hoping, honestly, I want a time jump because I hate reading, like, from kids' perspectives. Yeah, like, it is frustrating. To, like, read, like, 
Harry Potter, like the first few Harry Potter, just same with the movies, like the first few books and the first few movie, movies are really hard for me now to like reread or rewatch. Rewatching because, you know, child actors, but rereading because it's it's like the some same stuff thing. Just yeah. Happens. Yeah. yeah. It's just because like, children stupid. don't necessarily understand what's going on around them or adults in children's lives don't feel like they would understand so they just don't tell and it makes it does make a frustrating read which might be the point but it also i guess we're just not the audience for that type of story uh it's i feel like maybe we're just too old for that kind of story now or maybe but i do want a time jump i want like i get that they're like in school now so maybe Maybe we learn more, more about the mysteries since that's what they're learning about. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, can we just go to when they're like... When they're graduating? <laughs> like 16, 17, 18? I'm really hoping that the second book isn't like a Harry Potter reboot uh, of just oh, their God. life in, a, in, a, in the school and the troubles they have during school. I'm really. God, it might be. <laughs> Do you want me to read the uh, Mirror Gate Goodreads description? No, we need to save that for the for the ne- next <laughs> for the podcast right, right, right. that the next book is in. Uh, we put our expectations out there, so hopefully the second book lives up to the expectations. And if not, then. Maybe maybe we just won't make it through this entire series, and maybe we'll leave that up to our listeners to to decide whether we finish the series or not. Um, especially if anyone that's listening has actually read this book yet. Uh, and I guess we're a spoilers podcast now because we I think feel like we gave away all the spoilers to this book. Uh. That's true. We we definitely did, and we went straight into spoilers. We didn't <laughs> attempt to not, which is fine. I mean, it's okay. Like, we'll we'll leave a general review now, and we'll just cut that and put it in the beginning, so people who haven't read it will get that general review. They'll decide whether they want to read it, and then then we'll. So. I mean, we could do that, or we could just leave it. <laughs> I I mean that's up to you. You're gonna be the one editing it, so. Because like as far as a general like, a general review is basically what we already said, which was you know what you know what we could do all about rising action, and that's the entire book until the last two chapters. You know what we could do, um, uh-huh. just put a timestamp of where the general review is, so people. Oh can yeah, let's it. do that. I'll do that. Um, that'll be easier to just be like by the way we start with spoilers if you want no spoilers we kind of briefly talk about our overall feelings later um but yeah so all the books have good reviews though like 4.17 for stormglass 4.37 for the next one 4.44 for the third 4.42 4.46 so like well they don't have very many reviews though either well it's it just seems like we are not the ideal target audience. I feel like maybe this is a young or like a teen book, maybe. Um, maybe. I uh, mean, let me see how Goodreads is not maybe necessarily the best. Uh, oh, it does say young adult. Okay, so like, that's what it a- seems like. Because, it, I mean, the it's so not overly complicated. And I guess, you know, after reading the entire Wheel of Time series, which you have yet to finish, um, you know, I just am looking for something that's very complicated and, like, I don't know. The, the, like, the Wheel of Time series, for anyone that's read it, they know it's like a, it's a crazy story and it's a it's a really high bar for a lot of not almost no authors i feel can live up to Um, yeah it looks like a couple people uh, the the genres on goodreads are like from users and not like the publishers so i don't know if this book would actually be published in the young adult section um like if you went to barnes and noble i can see it in the teen slash young adult section i mean it, but a couple people 
people have actually marked it as middle grade. <laughs> so, yeah, this does, you know, this does uh, feel like a book that I would have read in like middle school. Um, yeah. Or maybe high school. I yeah, feel like so it. The language is critical. pretty. The language is pretty easy to like read. It was a quick read for sure. You know, it's a. I can't even remember how many pages it is, but it's not. It wasn't a long book. It, I feel like I read it really fast. Um, it just took me a while to read it because I'm not the target audience. Uh, clearly, it's targeting high school aged kids and in which case i would say this is a pretty good book because i've i'm looking back at some of the high yeah. school books i read and most of them are you know pretty bad now <laughs> yeah i mean i could see i could see uh reading this at like 13 14 <laughs> i mean that's when i started the wheel of time for the first time and i decided it was uh I mean, I got through, I think, six or so Wheel of Time books before. I was like, it's a little... I was like, I just couldn't keep up with the characters, really, because there's so many names, as you know. Um, yeah. But now, when I read it, uh, it's a lot easier to keep up. So maybe it is just a reading level type thing. Um, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, do we want an outro, or do we just want to be like, peace out, mother <laughs> Um, That's, I mean, I don't even know what an, <laughs> what an outro would entail at this point, other than, like, a thank you for listening. Um, oh, well. do should we do a tease for the next book we're doing? Are we going to do uh, Wizard's First Rule? Is that what we decided? Yeah, I, I think we should do Wizard's First Rule. I'm still reading... Uh, running with demons i'm like halfway um okay or, well rereading so yeah let's so next one yeah uh wizard's first rule by terry goodkind that's the that's the tease for the next review oh. uh hopefully we can stick to just the first book uh i think we can because the first book is pretty pretty easy to stick to it's the lighter uh, books that i right. feel like i kind of get mixed up Oh yeah, the, About, later, like, the first one. Orders of operations. No. Or order of operations. Whatever. Alright, well, I guess that's it. And I guess and look, thank you for listening or Yeah, we're I like because I feel like welcome is a good way to do like an intro, not that we really did much of one. And we and, I don't we didn't do one. It, we didn't no. do an intro. <laughs> Should we do an intro and, now? Uh, that you can cut and paste to the beginning and then do the out or we should do the outro and then and then do the intro and then you can just cut and paste it to the beginning <laughs> because no, i just no, couldn't rem think... remember the book for an intro i was like uh i think we leave it i think we leave all of that i think it'll be entertaining for people um and then we can just do a you know a nice thank you for listening uh as an outro because i think that's good like they've made it uh 50 minutes well it'll be less than that when i cut out a lot of this talk that yeah i'm actually in. surprised we made it this long 50 minutes is pretty good um yeah uh, so uh oh oh we should it. mention that we are going to transcribe the episode and oh, yeah. upload it to what is the website we are, i'm I'm gonna transcribe. Wow, we are a team, so <laughs> that's why I said. Fine, fine, fine. We are going to transcribe the episode to heartofthewolffantasy.com um, for anyone who, I guess, I mean, anyone who knows someone who would like to read podcasts. Read, read podcasts. Uh, not necessarily just deaf people, but just some people maybe prefer reading. Well, um, some people also might want to look back on certain things that we've said and not want to have to, like, find it in the audio. And that yeah, would make it just easier to, like, oh, they made a really good, like, comment about something. And it'll be there. It'll all be transcribed. Should And yeah. we'll try and have a link in the description to the website. Um, the website is published, yeah? You you have it published? It's up? Well, it's not, it's not active right this second, but yeah, I do have 
pulse, all I have to do is so uh, it, get rid of the the. It currently just says coming soon if you go there. Okay, but so it'll we actually pulse this start pulsing podcast. Yes, it will be active. <laughs> sweet, I wasn't sure. Um, is there anything else? Uh, yeah, just uh, bye. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>